Good evening. In the name of LAU Engineering Alumni, I would like to welcome you in our first lecture for the year 2013. Believing that we are a part of the society, we found ourselves committed to work hard for its improvement and enlightenment. We, LAU Engineering Alumni, with the support of LAU Administration and the School of Engineering, decided to launch several lectures on hot and major topics that our country and society is suffering from. Our aim is to highlight the problem and to find solutions from a professional perspective. And I insist professional perspective. There's nothing else. Before we start, I would like to thank President Jabra for, for being always a big support in our activities and events, Director of Alumni Office, Mr. Abdullah Al-Khal, and his team, Manu Ghanoum and Ghada Majid. Also, the engineering school, represented by Dr. George Nasser, the Dean of Engineering, and here it's nice to mention that Dr. Nasser is also a colleague in the engineering alumni, is an alumni uh, of uh, LAU. Uh, and finally, Rana Zaytouni and Shadi Naami for their effort and our, uh, for our, in our today lecture. I will leave the podium for Dr. Jabra to hear my things from him. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> on behalf of the university, on behalf of the university, I'd like to welcome you to our campus tonight. It is really indeed a beautiful evening. And I'd like to take this opportunity to salute the School of Engineering in the person of Dean Nas, the Alumni Association, the School of Engineering chapter, and of course, the Alumni Relations Office. Abdullah, thank you. For putting together this beautiful evening and this very, very important evening because what you're doing tonight goes to the heart of the institution mission. We firmly believe in lifelong education. We firmly believe in continuing education because as you well know, in a world that is so complex and complicated, in a globalized world, we need all the time to retool. We need all the time to be on top of what's going on in the world in terms of knowledge and in terms of skills. And that's the mission of the institution to be part of society, to respond to the needs of society, to respond to the needs of alumni, and to serve alumni, to make sure that the university stands ready all the time to help society meet its challenges. That's very, very important. And the topic tonight is so important to all of us. And we're all anxious to hear our professor address this particular topic, especially within the context of Lebanon. So thank you very, very much for coming tonight. And congratulations to our alumni, to the School of Engineering, the School of Engineering chapter, and to the Alumni Relations Office for putting together this beautiful evening. I said, thank you. <laughs> Esteemed guests, dear alumni and friends, I'm very happy this evening to join President Jabra to this lecture. Delivered 
by our own uh, assistant professor of civil engineering, Dr. John Khoury, alumni of LAU and assistant professor. We're proud of you, Dr. Khoury, being alumni and a, a faculty member of the school. We at the School of Engineering are driven by the collective aspiration of our faculty to become the premier school of engineering in the region. And believe me, we are making great strides toward reaching this goal. All five of our Bachelor of Engineering programs are ABIT accredited. ABIT, which stands for Accreditation Board for Engineering and Technology, which demonstrates our commitment to provide our students with a professionally and universally recognized quality engineering education. Our faculty is comprised of highly qualified experts who are ded dedicated to cutting-edge scholarship and actively engaged in the engineering profession as well. Our graduates are highly sought after by the industry for their technical competence, distinctive professional skills, and responsible work ethics. We have ambitious strategic plans for the school. Uh, to start with, we are planning a new state-of-the-art laboratory building which is due to be executed in 2015-2016. We are planning also new programs in chemical engineering as well as petroleum engineering that will add to, to our already rich offering. We also seek to provide an enriched forum for information exchange in engineering research and innovation. In this context, I believe this lecture will provide a stimulating discussions on the status of transportation system in Lebanon and will no doubt bring closer academia and community. Finally, I would like to thank the Alumni Association, the School of Engineering Chapter, the Alumni Relations Office for their efforts in organizing this lecture. I thank you all for your continued support for the School of Engineering. Thank you. Graduated in 2002 civil engineering from LAU with high distinction. Master in civil engineering in 2003 from Virginia Tech USA. PhD in civil engineering and transportation, especially transportation, in 2005 from Virginia Tech USA. Licensed as professional engineer in California USA in 2008. USA licensed as professional traffic operation engineer in 2009. Assistant professor in LAU since 2010 teaching the following, surveying, highway design, transportation system engineering, transportation planning and land use, highway design and management. Dr. John Khoury, whom I have the honor to present him today as our lecturer for our first hot topic, transportation in Lebanon. Tonight, we will be discussing the topic of transportation, and we will discuss a brief overview of the transportation engineering in general, and then we will go and focus on transportation engineering, which is the most interesting topic to everybody. So the presentation will be focused on uh, giving a brief introduction, and then we will discuss safety problems in Lebanon. We will give some uh, discussion about the issues leading to congestion in Lebanon, some solutions, and then we will go into discussing case studies that we have worked on in LU in the last three years since I joined. Okay, so let's introduce first what do transportation engineers do. Transportation engineering is basically, it is the engineering or the service of providing movement and goods of people uh, in a safe and efficient manner with uh, keeping in mind environmentally responsible men. Okay? So transportation is directly linked to our lives. Every one of us is affected by transportation on a daily basis. The better the transportation infrastructure, it's directly correlated to 
the economy, the efficiency of the economy, and the productivity of the economy. What are the modes of transportation out there? So we have the highways, motor vehicle, we have air transportation, marine transportation, railroads, and even pipelines are under the transportation engineering. In our lecture today, we will focus on highway engineering, and this is the main issues that we have in the world. Transportation engineering is two main fields. It captures planning and it captures the design phase. So it is a it is an engineering field that has uh, it has to have an integrated uh, planning and design process from the beginning till the end in order to get an efficient solution. So I will focus on the first part in planning, and then I will move on in my lecture to the design phase. What is the planning phase? We have urban planners. We hear about urban planners. We, have, we hear about urban plans for metropolitan areas. All these are, uh, need to be combined with the transportation planning and the metropolitan agencies so that they come up to evaluating what data we have about land use in a region. And then these land use data we can project with them to get what is the future uh, travel patterns, what is the future uh, trips on the highways that we should be expecting, and those will be loaded on current highway networks, and we will see how the system will perform. That's how we plan 20 years in advance. So basically, planning goes down into forecasting travel patterns of the society 20 years in advance. We get the land use data inputted into models, and we try to project what would be our problems before we get there. So it's a uh, really comprehensive effort joining land use, urban uh, planning, and transportation planning. As we saw in the previous slide, it's a cycle. So we feed the urban planning data to the transportation planners that project trips. They feed it to the infrastructure development people that build the required links in the network. Then once the development is done, we feed the data back to the network because once the links are built, development will be built around them. So this cycle goes on and on. It's updated on an annual basis. And it is for our projection 20 years in advance. OK. What do we use? There is multiple sources or multiple programs that we can use in order to project data in the future. It, the main goal is to be able to assess, is our current network sufficient to sustain the projected growth of people and trips 20 years ahead. So we test these uh, models, and we load all the network data in our uh, transportation planning software. The software will tell us where the trips will be congested, showing us where the red lines are. We feed this data to the uh, stakeholders who will be making decisions of how to upgrade this network. And then we will start our uh, development of the infrastructure. So the planning phase is the initial phase. It is the cornerstone of building a transportation network. Once we have those links identified, we start looking for alternatives to solve these problems in our network. These links are not sufficient to sustain future growth, so we start focusing on these things. The highway design process takes this information if, because we already collected the data, we already have the planning framework, we start developing alternatives to solve this problem. The alternatives should be addressed to the community. The alternatives should be responsive to the community needs. The alternatives should be also inclusive of all stakeholders' input. Then we take these alternatives, evaluate, screen them, have our criteria equalize between all alternatives, and then select the preferred one and go into construction. What are goals of a community related to transportation? Transportation is not any project. It's a project related to people, human. It's related to the economy. It's related to the environment. It is very crucial to the economy. So we will select our uh, alternatives based on certain objectives, like relieving congestion, like increasing mobility in our society, like reducing emissions for the environment, and reducing, of course, accidents. These are all measures of effectiveness that we can uh, assess by the effectiveness of each alternative and select the preferred one. 
And then, once we selected the preferred alternative, it's a straightforward chart. You just apply your engineering tools. They are out there. They are free. You just look at them, apply them with an uh, ethical sense, and you will get your um, preferred alternative applied <coughs> using the geometrics code, the pavement, the traffic devices code, and the drainage. At the end, we should not forget, we said we are transportation engineers. We should move people in a safe and efficient manner, but we have to always remember the environment. So there is a big process of environmental impact assessment that we have to go through. Every project in transportation is related to the environment directly. We are affecting pollution, noise. We are affecting our geology by building highways and roads and bridges. We are affecting the population. The development of the urban plan is also related to the transportation network. People live around highways and freeways. So, and one of these items that in the environmental impact assessment process is transportation and traffic. How are we updating the efficiency of the network? At the end, selecting any transportation objective or uh, alternative, it is always a trade-off analysis. You improve safety on one side, you improve efficiency on one side, you add the capacity. On the other side, you will be taking more land, you will be acquiring more businesses, you will be also uh, adding cost to your projects. So there is always this trade-off that we have to worry about. This is, in, in a nutshell, a small brief about the transportation planning process. So I want to focus now all the discussion from now on to that one. This is the interesting topic that we all worry about every day. What are we missing? The planning process, which is a comprehensive and integrated process between urban planning, land use, and transportation planning, is not evident in our projects. We don't see it. We don't, we don't see it in our urban, urban spread of developments in the nation. So data about urban spread, we don't have it. Data and comprehensive planning process are lacking. It, they led us to a over-the-threshold congestion that cannot be buried. We deal with it on a daily basis. They also led us to increase safety issues. And I will focus on these two main topics because they are really above threshold of acceptable levels. Safety in level. Everybody, we all know, we all heard stories about accidents. Do we really have a safety issue in level? Do we really have a trend of accidents that causing fatalities in Lebanon. This is the question. I've been trying to research this for the last three years, and what I found is I get so many data that are different. I go to lots of websites, I go ask the government, and all I'm getting is different numbers, different figures of accident data and fatalities. Is our trend increasing? Is our trend decreasing? All this uh, led me to contact the, the recent uh, established TMC, Traffic Management Center, and they told me that the number of deaths per year is about 820 people. Red Cross says it is more, Yaza says it's more, ISF says it's less. I believe this number is in the ballpark. So I went and compared this number to the US death on roads and highways. Before I get, I want to just highlight one thing. Because of this missing data and this missing database, we're not able to assess what our real problems are in safety. So I compared our number, just the number of death, to the U.S. figures. In the U.S. in 2005, which is the time when I graduated from college in transportation with focus on transportation safety, I was dealing with this issue a lot. We had 43,500 people die that year in the U.S. due to accidents on roads. So the government was not happy. We started focusing all efforts, research, and industry into finding solutions to these problems in any way possible because this figure was not acceptable. In 2010, this is when I left. It also happened when I left the U.S. The number went down to 32,885. This is a 24% reduction in the number of deaths in the U.S. How did we get there? We have an extensive data. In the US, they have an extensive data of all accidents 
or all causes leading to death on the road. What are the weather? What are the conditions on the road? What are the leading causes of these accidents? They are all tabulated and archived for every single accident. Using this data, we were able to derive all the solutions needed to in order to address these problems. So what we are missing here, a comprehensive data set, a comprehensive data set in Lebanon that is needed to assess the problems and devise solutions. Based on my observation, based on my experience, I tried to find some issues that the causes of these issues and the safety problems in Lebanon. Bear in mind only the number, this number, divided by our population. Compared to the US, we are two times more likely to die on the road than any other American. We're twice as likely to die for reasons we are not able to assess. One of the reasons is high level of aggressive driving. High levels of aggressive driving, we see it every day on the road. High levels of disrespect for traffic control devices like signs and signals. Minimum enforcement on the road. Uh, no system that connects your driving skills to the driver's license or to the system of points that penalize you. In vehicle driving distraction, very common. We will discuss each, or, each one of these points uh, in, a, in a little bit. Poor driving skills in the younger drivers who are very aggressive and the older drivers. Infrastructure, we don't have to mention a lot about that. We see it every day. Geometrics on our projects, below standards. I don't know which codes we are using. Drainage design, we will discuss that in details. Roadside design, roadside design is related to safety elements implemented on the road in order or in cases where vehicles lose control of their vehicles, they don't hit a bridge directly, they don't hit a barrier directly, that's a solid object. There should be safety devices on the road that can absorb these shock and give a chance of these errant vehicles to survive. Aggressive driving, what are we doing to curb aggressive driving in Lebanon? What are we doing, what kind of uh, programs are we sending out? What kind of education we are delivering to the public? There are so many programs we can implement and we don't have to reinvent anything. It's all out there, we just have to have the will to invent, to implement it. Disrespect of science. And this is a really a major issue. People drive on the road with little respect to the lanes, with little respect to the uh, panels that are uh, telling us what is the law on the road and what is the guidance on the road. Okay? And I like this figure by Yaza, which is very uh, expressive. But we cannot only blame drivers all the time. We have to also blame ourselves as stakeholders who are implementing such projects. What are the codes that are unified and system in a system way that all signs on the road that are law or informative should have the same backgrounds and the same shapes so that we know them automatically? Not to mention every sign that is related to the highway, next to it there is 1,500 signs related to something else. So we are now, as drivers, immune to signs. We just drive past them. They are now a matter of distraction. Law enforcement, there should be definitely. In such a, um, in such a country, we are not a big country, we can have a highway patrol unit that is only focused on implementing laws for traffic, etc. All they do is implement traffic laws. And it is a co coordination effort between the governments, municipalities. Uh, driving distractions, big problem. We also cannot, we cannot blame the drivers because they are being distracted in their cars. We are sitting in traffic on a daily basis for an hour or two. What else can we do when the car is only rolling every day when we're going to work or coming back from work? People send their uh, emails, people answer their calls, and now they get used to it. If you're not sitting in traffic, you're still texting and messaging. This is really a service. Younger and older drivers, younger drivers very aggressive, always speeding. How are we educating them? Older drivers, we have to accept that they have a little bit slower reaction times. They sometimes fall asleep, get tired behind the wheel. So we also have to address those issues. 
we also have, can focus from the simple statistics showed us that teenage drivers are more susceptible to death in the time between 9 and 12, midnight. This is because normally they are drunk and driving. So we can focus on that problem and try to solve it by uh, simple enforcement, by education of the drivers, by promoting programs that can help us curb this issue. Poor infrastructure. I don't know what to say about the infrastructure. I live somewhere, I don't want to name the municipality, but every other month we have the road being excavated. Sometimes for water pipes, sometimes for sewer pipes, sometimes for electric pipes. Uh, cords, cables. How is the coordinated effort of maintaining the highway pavement is done? How is it done? What kind of system? Why do we have to suffer as drivers every time between excavation? If the, if the uh, electric company doesn't excavate, the storm, rainstorm comes and excavates the road. In some way, we always are sitting in a pond on the road. The last storm, a month ago, or a half, uh, two months ago, maybe in January, half of the country was shut down because of one storm. What are we doing for drainage purposes? What are we doing for drainage on the highway? It's one of the most critical elements uh, in the design of a highway. It's the drainage system. The drainage system should be sufficient to sustain all water flow on the road. And this is, this is how we welcome our tourists at the airport. The lower figure on the right, this is the airport that day. We welcomed our tourists with a flood of water. This is all because we are lacking drainage design. And the design of drainage on the road is only one simple equation. Q equals CIA, very simple equation. And application is really, really simple. Roadside safety devices, how many times do we see cushions on the road. How many times do we see attenuators on next to bridge piers and uh, solid barriers? You hit a solid barrier, you're definitely not ending in a good situation. So these devices cost less than 1% of the cost of the project, and we cannot find them on our highways and on our uh, piers and on our bridges and abutments to save an errant vehicle. This is about safety for now. Let's discuss the congestion problem. And the funny picture about this is, if you look at congestion in anywhere in the world, you will see congestion on one side, one direction. In Lebanon, it is in both directions everywhere. Congestion has no direction. This is a PM on the highway from Nahr al Mot to uh, Jum. PM meaning the EPR. So, Observation also, because databases are lacking. I cannot go log to a uh, comprehensive database that will tell me how much I will be sitting in traffic every day, or how much is the congestion, or how many miles are we driving. Based on observation, and uh, asking my peers and my friends over the last three years, on average, Lebanese people sit in traffic one to two hours a day. Simple uh, observation. What is the cost of that? How do we assess this cost? As stakeholders, governments, municipalities, what are we doing to avert this cost on the user? This leads only to driver stress, increased road rage. Aggressive driving adds up. You start making maneuvers that are more risky than usual. You just want to get to your destination. You start ignoring traffic signs and signals. And this is what we just said. We are causing these problems. And you start, of course, every day, I leave my house and I say, I'm not going to get mad today. I will drive quietly and get to my work in a calm, peaceful manner. But something happens on the road to change that fact. People just neglect road etiquette. This leads only to more accidents, more pollution, and, of course, less productivity as a nation. Congestion that's not new. Every metropolitan agency, a metropolitan place, has its own problem. Uh, UK, uh, London, I mean, Austin, and Berlin, San Diego, Los Angeles, all these cities are major cities that are facing congestion all over. What are they doing? We don't need to invent anything. 
We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We just can adopt their policies and apply it to them to save the user from all this stress and all this waste for them. In this figure, I like this figure. I know it does not apply to Lebanon. We don't drive in a straight line between the lines. But it is very expressive of us being single user people. We like to drive our cars on our own, on a daily basis. We don't like to carpool, but we say sharing rides. We love our cars. And we are excused for that because we don't have a reliable option to replace the car. We do not have a reliable and really uh, efficient option to replace this car. What do we need? <coughs> Solutions are very obvious. We can build new capacity, manage the current capacity, apply new technologies, and increase your efficiency. And how to do that? We can start first by incentivizing other modes of transportation, and especially the public <coughs> mode of transportation. Public mode of transportation includes buses. One in particular, which I like, is the bus rapid transit. Rail systems, monorail and metro rail. High speed rail, maybe we are a small country for such an application. Ride sharing, we cannot get to ride sharing and tolling before we start solving, before we provide an option to the driver, which is different from the vehicle option. So we get to the park and ride, carpooling and sharing options when we provide a different option. Bus rapid transit, Let, let's discuss that. And I want to thank my students for using the bus today. They saved some congestion on the road. Many of them used one bus. One bus can replace all the vehicles shown in this image. And this is from them. If you have a reliable service, efficient service, frequent service, and it is dedicated, meaning the bus does not stop every two seconds. The bus does not pick up anybody on the road. You will have special stops at the uh, community centers, picking up people from those community centers and delivering them to the central business district. And you will have this loop. Once it is frequent, reliable, people will shift modes. Why would I not use a bus where I can work on the bus, going to work, and coming out? I can be productive and not worry about driving the car. Of course, stops that have information about where the bus is and how long it will take to come and how long will it take to get you to the destination is more attractive to people like that, to, to shift modes. Rail systems, monorail, it is really a nice system, high capacity, reliable and safe. It is environmentally very friendly, it runs on electricity. And it takes minimum right away. As we see in the figure here, you can build a monorail system, for example, right over the highway. One issue, though, of course, electricity. We need to solve our main problem in the country and then move on to this problem. When can, where can we apply it? Juni Kasli corridor, every day. Every day, people sitting there, 30 minutes or more, 40 minutes or more on the way to work and on the way out. There is traffic on both sides. If you build a monorail system, people start shifting more. Instead of taking 40 minutes to get to the entrance of Peru, it would take you only five, 10 minutes. Definitely you would shift more. And of course, Kaslik Juni uh, has very limited right of way because of the development on both sides of the highway. So mon monorail application like we see is a viable option to consider. Streetcar in downtown. Downtown is facing so much congestion. Day, we go, we call downtown, it's the touristic area. Yet, you get stuck in downtown every day, 30, 40 minutes. So what are we doing to solve these problems? Downtown is a walkable city. It is delineated as a walkable city because of the weather, very nice weather, very nice development. Why can't we have it as a touristic, fun, environmental, and friendly city to navigate? So we can apply a streetcar that goes 
on top of the highway system, giving you all the options to travel within the city. Surprisingly, we had the street car in the past. And it is gone now. I wish it comes back. Once we have these options, we have these monorail systems, we have this bus rapid transit, all these uh, public transit options that will make you shift from the vehicle use to this system. You can start thinking of cordoning this area. Try implement, once you implement these options, you don't allow people anymore or you try to incentivize them or asking them to use other modes. So going into Beirut, it will cost you money to enter Beirut. You cordon that area totally, so people will shift to other modes. Within Beirut, now I have it called on. Within Beirut, I start applying streetcar, bikes, car to go, and segways. And we will discuss some of these innovative concepts that are being applied all over uh, the world. One of them, car to go, simple, small cars. They are being located in major cities everywhere. You find them on the corner. You just, with a credit card, log in into the car, make your small trip and can leave it wherever it's assigned. This saves the environment pollution because it's electric. It saves unnecessary trips. And it removes all these cars that, is, that are not needed from the central business district. And it is sustainable. Other modes, segways, bikes, all these help, the street car that we discussed, help make the trips within the downtown area so that you don't, you don't Force. Now we are forcing people to use their cars because this is the only option we have. And the last option I want to discuss is how to increase the efficiency of the system. Intelligent transportation system, what is it about? It is about adding the efficiency of the current system without increasing capacity. Add the efficiency and, of course, increase the safety record of that system. There is a lot of techniques that are being researched and applied. It's not a matter of research anymore. It's being applied. Vehicle to vehicle communications, uh, vehicle to infrastructure communications, and now successful testing of autonomous vehicles. Vehicles will be driving themselves very soon. Maybe you don't believe this, but it will be happening. Such a system will increase efficiency. First, it will increase safety record because 93% of all accidents are human-based error. Okay? And give the control to the computer, this record will be much improved. Of course, better fuel efficiency. I would like you to listen now to a, this is a small uh, presentation by a professor from Stanford. They are working on a uh, model for autonomous vehicles with Google. It has this car that they have created. It has uh, driven 140,000 miles successfully in cities, in rural areas, in mountains, without any accidents or any problems. First, in the Barca Grand Challenges, where the US government issued a prize to build self-driving cars that could navigate the desert. And even though 100 teams were there, these cars went nowhere. So we decided at Stanford to build a different self-driving car, built with hardware, software. We made it learn from us, and we set it free in the desert. And the unimaginable happened. It became the first car to ever return from the Double Grand Challenge, bringing Stanford $2 million, yet it still hadn't saved a single life. Since our work is focused building driving cars that can drive anywhere by themselves. Any street in California, you've driven 140,000 miles. Our cars have sensors from which they magically can see everything around them and make decisions about every aspect of driving them. It's the perfect driving method. You've driven in cities, like in San Francisco here. <coughs> We've driven from San Francisco to Los Angeles on Highway 1. They call it joggers, busy highways, tall woods. And this is without a person in the loop. The car just drives itself. In fact, while we drove 140,000 miles, 
people didn't even notice. Mountain roads, day and night, and even <coughs> crooked Lombard Street in San Francisco. Sometimes our cars get so crazy, they even do uh, the little stunts. Oh my god! What? What? It's not a matter of research anymore. It's a matter of fact happening. It will happen. Are we going to apply it in Lebanon? I'm not saying now. We just need to start looking where everybody else is going and try to follow the trend. This sums the first, the first part of my lecture, which is about congestion and safety. From now on, we will be discussing case studies, specific case studies of design that has been implemented. I have worked with my students in the last three years on these case studies, and I would like to share with you this information. The first one, which is a very popular subject now. We had a bridge. Now it's gone, and now they are looking for new alternatives. It is, let's state the facts, we have a main movement and we have a crossroad on this movement. The crossroad is a minor movement compared to the freeway. So we need to find the best solution that can fit the society, which is JDB, at the same time also keep in mind the main movement, which is always uninterrupted. A nice application is the one that is shown next to Abyssin, but they have a nice tight diamond. The tight diamond is, does not need space. It provides uninterrupted flow on the freeway. It connects the crossroad to the freeway with ramps. The ramps <coughs> exit the freeway up and enter the freeway down, which is very logical, because when you exit, you exit from a high-speed road to a small, is a lower speed road. So you need this ramp going up to help you slow down. And on the way into the freeway, you need the ramp to help you accelerate and join the speeds of the freeway. So a tight diamond, I work with my students, a tight diamond is really simple to design, really simple to construct also, because the interruption to the main movement is minimum. The main movement stays at grade and you implement this solution on top. We have used, we have obtained the right-of-way constraints and tried to fit the solution, and it works. Let's see. I will show you now the simulation of the operations. Here is the physical design geometrically within the constraints of the road, that is the C row plus all the buildings around in general. Operationally, we will see if it works. So, two control intersections at top. Of course, not me. Implementing such a solution is followed with control. You have to control the solution. You cannot allow uncontrolled intersections that would cause the, uh, congestion on the ramps because of random driving of uh, drivers, and then will cause back up into the field. So we have to control uh, with two intersections. The two intersections will be coordinated to prevent also the queue from one intersection to the other. Small statistic. I ran the simulation in the PM peak hour, which is in the evening. The numbers, my students went to the road, we counted those by videos, by counters, every direction. Okay. And we simulated it. We found out that a tight diamond with two intersections coordinated on average will delay every driver entering Jalliti for one minute. On average. Compared to now, it takes me 25 extra minutes going back home because I have to go to Nahrin Mode, turn on the loop, come back and jump take the exit, or go into the streets of Antony. So that's, that is all related to user cost, delay, and time, less productivity. How are we accounting for that? 
The second project that I want to discuss is the Jaita condition. The figure is the existing condition leading you to Ajatun Jaita area. If you're coming from Kaslik and you need to go to Ajatun, the thing that you have to do is break to the maximum. You're on the freeway and then make a 90 degrees turn and go on this loop, get to Ajantun, which backs up all the traffic behind it and causes, of course, rear-end accidents and congestion. Not to mention, very important, when, the, when this interchange was built, there was a frontage road, which is, should not and is separate from the freeway, who was on the east side of the freeway. Now it is part of the interchange, so it is disconnected. Frontage road cannot be mixed with the freeway. These are separate facilities. So what are the conditions? We have Ajantun Road. It's also a, an important movement. And the main movement on the highway, the Castile Highway. We have to provide deceleration, acceleration lanes. We have to provide the change in elevation from the main road to Ajantun because it's higher. And this is done by loops. But you provide deceleration lanes before the loop so that you don't affect flow on the main loop. Okay, And, of course, frontage road should be kept separate from the freeway system. So we designed a system where the frontage road, the one shown in yellow on the east side, and this is north. And we also introduced a loop. However, the loop this time, the loop has a deceleration before and it is in the direction of traffic. You don't have to turn 90 degrees and then come opposite. Okay? We try to keep the existing connector, which I heard there is problems on it. Of course, the radius on this connector is below standard for the speed, the design speed that is applied on this road. The frontage road is separate, and the ramp that connects Beirut to Ajaltun going northbound is separate from the front control. Now you exit and you are faced with weaving traffic which uh, blocks all the movement entering that offering. So we try to see if this work will work and it definitely does. It is a simple solution, retrofit solution to what we have. We try to maintain, as we said, this large connector that probably cost a lot of money that is around the buildings. We try to maintain it, the one that goes from the Ajaltun all the way to Beirut. And we try to find a solution to retrofit this case. Movement, this is the same PM peak movement that was counted on a daily basis by my students. We input this volume and we simulated the operations of this interchange, and it is very efficient. Last but not least, the best one, Nahr al-Mot. Nahr al -Mot interchange is the best interchange. I have called the TMC in the last month and asked them, please give me an exact figure of how many people enter that interchange and exit that interchange on a daily basis. The response was 250,000 daily. 250,000, the main and major entrance to the central business district, Beirut, and we only designed one level interchange, one level that would allow the movement of 250,000, which is impossible. One level interchange with loops and radius that are way below standard. This is a system interchange. What is a system interchange? It is a connection between two main movements, Abdet uh, Highway and Jaladid Main Road. Two main movements with all directions. There is standards and codes that you can select from and apply to this area. You tell me there is right of ways? Yes, there is right of way. There is constraints on the sides of the interchange, but we can do <coughs> Most important thing, flow is uninterrupted at all times. This is a freeway system, connected to a freeway system. All direction maps and uninterrupted flow. No stopping. Everybody should be moving continuously. 
if we don't want to select from the standards, we can revise the standards to fit our situation. But selecting a small interchange that is one level for 250,000, of course, will not cut the deal. So let's start discussing the small elements that are really obvious and sadly to say wrong. <coughs> From the checklist, before designing any interchange that is system, you have to go through a checklist. It's a code. You read through the checklist and apply each one of them, and the result is always guaranteed operationally well and safe. I will only highlight four of those that are really important. Lane balance. You enter the interchange with three lanes. You have to exit with three lanes. A lane should not disappear anywhere. Ramps. You exit on the right. You enter on the right. Drivers expect to enter and exit on the right. This is driver's expectancy. Right hand side exits only and entrances. <coughs> Speeds of the ramps comparable to the speed of the highway because this is uninterrupted flow, no stopping. And of course, you want to elim eliminate weaving. You don't want to add weaving to the life. Weaving is the crossing of travel patterns to different directions. When you have such a situation, the result is rear-end crashes, more accidents, and more congestion and back. Okay, this figure.